Okay, so this is now Sunday morning. Okay, so we are still in the section of the, according to the ground plan of the Mangala Sutta, the section that I call um, developing a spiritual life, cultivating inner virtues and wisdom. So we've gone through reverence, humility, contentment, gratitude, and then timely hearing of the Dhamma. Now we come to the second verse in this, in this group or this set. So this is verse number nine, in which we're going to encounter patience, being amenable to advice, the seeing of renunciants, and timely discussion on the Dhamma. So let us read the verse itself. Kanti chaso vachasata Kanti chaso vachasata Samanan cha dasanam Samanan cha dasanam Kalena dhammas Kalena dhammasat kacha Kalena dhammasat kacha Etam mangala muttamam Etam mangala muttamam and then the English, patience being amenable to advice. Patience being amenable to advice. The seeing of renunciance. The seeing of renunciance. And timely discussion on the Dhamma. And timely discussion on the Dhamma. This is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Okay, so the first of the virtues that we come to in this series is patience. And this is, of course, it's one of the most difficult qualities to cultivate, but also it's one of the most important for us to cultivate, not only in terms of following the Buddha's path, but also in terms of our usual day-to-day -day relationships. Um, when I reflect on patience, it seems to me that we could distinguish three aspects of patience. So one of these is patience in dealing with other people, so patience in human relationships. The second aspect is patience under difficult circumstances. And then the third is patience in our practice of Dhamma. Okay, so first, patience in human relationships. So this is the, you could say that patience is the antidote, in this case, to anger. Anger directed to other people. And usually, in the Buddhist tradition, they say that anger is an aspect of hatred. But it seems to me that maybe the psychological distinctions are not sharp enough here. Because I would distinguish hatred from anger, in that anger can arise even towards people that one doesn't hate, that one loves, but just when things about that person might provoke you, what things that person says might provoke you, um, the mannerisms of that person can get <laughs> irritated. <laughs> and I think it happens in almost any long-term relationship that some degree of friction is likely to arise, and if that friction is not dealt with in the initial stages, then it will grow into real, even can become explosive anger. And then if anger becomes persistent enough, then it can turn into real hatred. Okay, so we want to learn how to deal with anger in the initial stages of when dealing with other people. And so there are several like antidotes that I find I found useful. 
Are those chickens out there? Yes. <laughs> Several methods that I found useful with dealing with anger and interpersonal relationships. One of these is to, especially what's most important perhaps, is to put oneself in the place of the other person. Like too often we look at situations from our own individualized point of view. And so we just remain sort of embedded within our own skin. And for this reason, we're not able to look at a situation from the multiple points of view and recognize that the other person has their perspective on the situation. And so we have to be able to sort of calm down, not immediately grasp our own opinion, our own perspective, and think, I'm right, the other person is wrong, and then engage in a kind of aggressive combat with the other person. But consider that the other person has their own feelings as well. They have their convictions that they are right, even though of course they're wrong. <laughs> but still one has to acknowledge their point of view. And then try to resolve the disagreement in ways that will be mutually satisfactory, satisfying. Like when I first encountered Buddhism, my first teacher, this was in graduate school in California, my first teacher was a Buddhist monk from Vietnam, and I came to live with him for a few years, and he became my first Buddhist teacher, and in those days, sort of my information about Buddhism was coming from the books by D.T. Suzuki and his Anglo-American interpreter Alan Watts. And so whenever he would teach me Buddhism and something that he said would not agree with what I was reading from Alan Watts, then I would challenge him and hold very fiercely to my point of view and think he doesn't know anything about Buddhism. <laughs> but, but I know because I found it in Alan Watts. <laughs> and so he taught me one lesson that proved very, very valuable to me for many, many years. And that is when getting into a kind of disagreement, he taught me that I should bring to mind one phrase, one statement, I might be right or I might be wrong. What's important is not to be right and to show the other person to be wrong, but to find out what is the truth or when doing things, what is the best, really the best way of doing something. So this is a way of helping to free us from the attachment to our own opinions, our own convictions, our own habitual way of doing things. Okay, so the situations where one is in a one-to-one -one relationship with a person, and out of disagreements or personality clashes, there will arise anger. And if you see that the person is really doing something wrong and you're convinced that the person is doing wrong, sometimes, I mean, this doesn't mean that one just passively submits to the other person, but sometimes one has to recognize that the other person is subject to their own sort of conditioning. And sometimes you could see that they are the victim of their own conditioning. And in this way, you could generate compassion for the other person. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to follow the way they want to do things, or that you have to accept their opinion. But when you have compassion for the other person, then it helps to still the anger, so that you can relate to the other person, even stand up and disagree with them, even present a rather forceful argument for your own position, but you do it with a calm mind, not yielding to anger.
And what one finds, particularly as a practitioner, that it's extremely important to keep patient, patience, to remain patient in relationships to others or other, under difficult conditions. Because when one explodes and gets anger, and gets angry, that anger just reverberates in the mind over and over. <laughs> and so that, <laughs> when one sits down to meditate after a rather aggressive or abrasive conflict with somebody, then you find that the angry thoughts just keep on repeating themselves over and over. It becomes like a broken record, rehearsing all of the arguments in which you are engaged. And the mind just doesn't get the opportunity to settle down and to become quiet and still. And so if you can settle these interpersonal conflicts calmly, whether you prevail or the other person prevails, then when you come back to your practice, you won't have this continued repetition, rehearsal of all of the arguments that took forth, that took place back and forth. But you'll know that you've settled the conflict, the disagreement, in a way that's hopefully mutually satisfactory, or if not mutually satisfactory, at least in a way that has some degree of, you say, justice to it. And then you can go into your practice with a settled and calm mind. Yeah, another, yeah, sort of another tool that one could bring in to develop patience is reflection on anatta or non-self. Even it doesn't mean that you have to have previously had a deep penetrative insight into non-self, but you can just use like the formula for non-self just as a theme for reflection. And so when you get into these conflictual situations, you bring the reflection on non-self in and it tends to take, you might call it the intense personal element out of the disagreement. You know, so when there's a disagreement about something or, dis or some kind of conflict of personalities, we're always thinking in terms of that one and me, him and me, her and me. And so this, the conflict sort of constellates and congeals around these notions of I and the other, I and the other. <laughs> but if you just, as the heat of the conflict is starting to escalate, and you bring in the reflection, all of this, not mine, not I, not myself, not theirs, not them, not their self, and just see that this is just impersonal processes taking place, just phenomena of body and mind. And then when you pull out that I and them, I and the other, out from the conflict, then the anger tends to settle down, and one can address the situation again with a calm, collected mind, an attempt to resolve the conflict in a peaceful and amenable way. And another sort of tool for dealing with rising anger, which has often been noted, is instead of, you know, the tendency, particularly as tensions are building up between people, when somebody says something disagreeable, provocative, one immediately reacts. So just, it's a little bit like pressing <laughs> if I hit the mouse, then the screensaver disappears and text, text appears. So we react in the same way. As soon as somebody says something provocative, we react. 
And too often, I have to say, in this country, maybe not amongst us who are Buddhist practitioners, but in a country in which guns are just, the country is like a wash, a sea of guns, and when people get into conflicts, then it isn't, it's just too easy for somebody to reach for the gun and boom, boom, and the other person is dead. And what doesn't, once one shoots another person, there's no way to stop, to turn back the life cycle. Okay, so one method to help us get our control over our mind is by when anger is rising up, instead of reacting immediately, bring the mind into the body, but bring the mind to the breath, and just make it a point. <coughs> is this my... <coughs> and just turn the attention to the breath, and you could take either three mindful <coughs> in-breaths and out-breaths, so five mindful in-breaths and out-breaths, and just sort of settle into the body, into the breath, and then come back to the situation, and then one could deal with the tension, again with the calm mind. And as I said before, patience doesn't mean, that in interpersonal relationships, doesn't mean that one is going to have to reject your opinion, or your way of doing things, and follow what the other person wants to do. Sometimes, as I said, you have to stand up and defend your point of view. But when you do it calmly, and with kindness and compassion towards the other person, you'll find that it's much more effective and much more beneficial to everybody than just reacting immediately with anger. Because when you react with anger, then the other person will respond with anger. Then, when the other person responds with anger, then you get more angry. And then when you get more angry, the other person gets more angry, until if things are not settled, either the friendship breaks, and in some cases, it could lead to physical blows. And in those cases where people have easy access to guns, to shooting and killing, There are so many tragedies in this country that could be, well, I don't want to get into that now, but <laughs> if there were really strict controls on access to these guns, so many tragedies could have been avoided. Okay, so this is patience, just a few words about patience in regard to other people. Uh, let's just see what some of the texts I have, some texts. Okay, here's a, a sutta that speaks about five dangers in anger and five benefits in patience. So the dangers in anger, what is dis disagreeable to many, to many people, one gets many enemies, one has many faults, one dies confused. <laughs> I'm serious, it's, it's quite serious. You know, if somebody is a, with an angry temperament, then when death comes, if their mind is still prone to anger, those mental tendencies come up, I believe, at the time of death. And so then, the, especially if the person dies suddenly, you know, unexpectedly, then they're going to get angry. Why is this happening to me? Okay, and then, but if one is patient, okay, we, we'll come to that next. Then with the breakup after, of the body after death, one is reborn in the plane of misery. Okay, then the five benefits and benefits and patience, one is pleasing and agreeable to many people, one does not have many enemies, in fact one easily acquires friends, one does not have many faults, because anger sort of provokes many other faults, as we'll see in the text to come. One does not have many faults. One dies calmly, unconfused. 
and then with the breakup of the body after death, one is reborn in a good destination. It is a sutta that speaks about five methods of removing resentment. Resentment is a kind of result of deep-seated anger by which you can remove resentment towards anyone. So one is developing loving-kindness towards the person one resents. Another is developing compassion for that person. A third is developing equanimity. So not being disturbed and provoked by that person. Okay, then one disregards the person one resents and pays no attention to them. That actually seems very similar to equanimity. Maybe equanimity is just maintaining a calm mind in relation to that person. And then one applies the idea of the ownership of karma to the person one resents. That is, if that person is doing a lot of bad things towards you, and provoking you in various ways, then you just, on the one hand, you don't react to that person and you think, Everybody receives the results of their own karma, so if this person wants to bully me and um, attack me and slander me, that is their karma. And so in this way, I'm not going to get angry in response to that person. Now that is a beautiful sutta. <coughs> When the Buddha is addressing the monks and he says, Others might speak to you in various ways. Their speech might be timely or untimely, rough or gentle, kind or hateful, and so on. In all such cases, you should train thus. Our minds will remain undisturbed. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare, with the mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. And we shall pervade that person with a mind of loving kindness. And starting with that person, we spread the, lo <coughs> the loving kindness through the whole world with a mind that's like the earth, just as the earth can't be disturbed no matter what people do to it. So one has a mind that's imperturbable, without hostility and without ill will. And then the Buddha says, even if bandits were to come with a two-handled saw and start severing you from limb to limb. One who gives rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Okay, then, so, so this is the aspect of patience in regard to um, relationships with other people, provocative relationships with other people. Then there's patience under difficult circumstances. So one can get ill, even have a persisting chronic illness that causes sometimes a lot of pain, that's saps one's strength. There can be disagreeable weather. Sometimes one has to endure extreme heat. Like just last week we had, it was so hot that if I went outside, I had to make sure to stay in the shadows. If I went in the sun, it became almost unendurable. And I had to go to New York City on Monday and walk a distance to get to the, my destination. And it was four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was just so hot I couldn't stay out in the sun. I couldn't walk on the street in the sun, I had to walk on this part of the sidewalk close to the buildings where there was shadow being cast. And now it's almost like, <laughs> I feel like the touch of winter coming. <laughs> okay, and then when the winter really comes here, like last year, periods where just so cold that one can't go from building to building in the monastery where I stay. 
just too cold. So, many different situations, and then if one doesn't have, if one doesn't cultivate patience, one easily can become upset with these fluctuations in the weather or with the afflictions, natural afflictions of the body. Um, one can become upset, despondent, even can fall into despair, despair, as happens with many people who suffer from chronic illnesses. And so one has to train oneself in patience. And so the Buddha speaks about especially for the monk's life back in ancient India, where it was very, very tough, where they would have to travel probably eight or nine months out of the year. And the weather can be hot at times, rainy at times, the sun can come blazing down, other times wet, rainy winds are blowing. There's always the danger of snakes, encounters with snakes and wild animals. So the Buddha teaches that one has to be patient in enduring all of these hardships. And so in everyday life there are many hardships and difficult conditions that one has to endure patiently. Which doesn't mean that, again, that one just doesn't try to change the conditions that cause those situations. But when all attempts to change fail, or when the conditions are due to things that can't be reversed, like an illness that just won't respond to treatment, then one has to have a mind of patience and endurance and determination. And actually, very much the same principles apply to Dhamma practice. Like sometimes, particularly like if you read the suttas, at least certain suttas, you see how a monk sits down, crosses the legs, and then dispels the five hindrances, and then enters first, second, third, fourth jhana, and then everything comes to its culmination with the attainment of arhatship. It seems almost like it's happening in one sitting. And yet we sit down, and <laughs> unless one has very, very strong, favorable conditions from the past, so many problems arise. And so if one doesn't have patience, one will easily become discouraged with one's practice, then give up and think, it's just not working for me. <laughs> I just don't have enough merits from the past. <laughs> um, yeah, so one has to recognize that this journey of the Dhamma it's a slow and gradual process, and we have to go through each step with a long, enduring mind. Sort of make the determination that I'm going to follow this path to the end, even if it takes me a hundred thousand lifetimes, but I'm going to follow and continue with the practice. And recognize when obstacles arise, of course one has to check to find what are the suitable remedies for those obstacles, but recognize that the obstacles, actually this was another piece of advice that my first teacher gave me, that the obstacles are the path. If there were no obstacles, there would be no purpose of having a path. And so it's learning how to deal with the obstacles, the inner obstacles, the outer obstacles, that constitute the training itself. So if you have this attitude towards the obstacles, then you can be patient with yourself and recognize that this is the way in which I develop, is by facing these obstacles and dealing with them and remaining patient in the face of those obstacles. Okay, the next quality that comes in the Mangala Sutta, in a way this is closely related to patience, 
can't teach a Sova Chasata. Yeah, it's the Pali word is Suva Sova Chasata and it's translated into English as being easy to correct. Well more literally it's being easy to speak to. There's a derivation of the word. There's su. Plus bachas. Okay, the prefix su usually has the meaning of something which is good, which is pleasant, which is easy. And then the word vachas means speech. And then it becomes an abstract noun, so the chasita. So if you take it superficially, you think, I think it means being good in speech, <laughs> being a good speaker. But that's not the meaning. The meaning rather is being easy to speak to, being easy to correct. And this is the opposite of the opposite quality is Dora plus bachas. Somebody who is do bacha is somebody who is difficult to speak to. And we find the example given here of being difficult to speak to in this sutta. So this is, I think it's Mahamogalana speaking. And he's giving the example of a monk who says to the community of monks, he says, let the monks correct me, I need to be corrected by you. So this monk recognizes he has some faults and he wants the monks to correct him. Perhaps this was a procedure in the Sangha in the early days where a monk would invite other, the elder monks to correct him. Okay, but this monk has qualities that make him difficult to correct, difficult to speak to. So some of these qualities, he has evil desires, that is, he has the desire for say, praise and admiration and honor from others. So when he gets corrected and others sort of find his faults and criticize him, even trying to help him, then he reacts and he doesn't accept the advice, he rejects the advice. Then there's a monk who praises himself and disparages others, so when others speak to him, he gets angry in return. And then the monk gets angry, he's overcome by anger, he becomes angry and resentful, angry and stubborn, and so on. And then the last one is very interesting. And I think we see this so often in ourselves, here the monk adheres to his own views, holds to them tenaciously, and relinquishes them with difficulty. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, this is the quality that makes one difficult to speak to, since if one has a view, one holds to it, my opinion is right, your opinion is wrong, then it's difficult to correct that person. Okay, and so the opposite is what makes one easy to speak to. So one is, doesn't have these evil desires and is not dominated by them, one doesn't praise oneself or disparage others, one doesn't get angry easily and so forth, and one doesn't adhere to one's own views and um, cling to them tenaciously and relinquish them but one relinquishes them easily. Yeah, so this, I would say, this, this quality of being easy to speak to is a very, very valuable asset in our spiritual training, particularly when we're living in a community or a sangha, and that it's necessary for the people in the community to, be, to live together harmoniously. And if somebody 
is doing something which is, say, disruptive to the community, somebody is acting in ways that we say are self-centered, or that create difficulties and obstacles for others, somebody is greedy, somebody is being excessively self-righteous, and so on, then it becomes necessary for the members of the community to take action, to correct that person. And so this can be done either by one, say, appointed member of the community taking the person aside and speaking to them in order to correct them, or I guess if the person's disruptive behavior becomes persistent and habitual enough, then it might be necessary for the whole communi community to get together and to speak to that person. And so if one is going to progress along the path, you know, sometimes we might be <coughs> behaving in that way unknowingly or unintentionally, or even if we're acting intentionally, but if we have a good character and we're really sincere, then we would, we would be willing to change our ways, to correct our faults. And so then, when somebody speaks to us to correct us, then we should be willing to accept the advice, if we think the advice is valid. And then, of course, if the community gets together and decides to speak to us, then we should be willing to accept their advice and change our ways to fit in more harmoniously with the community. Unless, of course, if we feel that the community is being unjust in their criticism of us, then of course we should have the option to defend ourselves, but if the defense proves to be empty, then we might have to, or our attempts at defense prove to be unconvincing, then we might have to leave that community. And in any case, to make if we see that there's a good community, people that we admire and respect, and that have our best interests at heart, and they correct us, then we should be willing to accept their advice. And sometimes within any community it becomes necessary, if somebody is a real troublemaker, to expel them from the community. So we have Kanti Chaso Vachasaka. Then the seeing of renunciance. So this is in Pali, it's Samana Nancha Dasana. So the word Samana was a word that was used broadly in Indian spiritual culture in the time of the Buddha for those renunciants who were not the members of the Brahminic orders. So the Buddha himself became a Samana. He was known by his contemporaries as the Samana Gotama, the ascetic Gotama. And the Buddhist monks and nuns also called Samanas. And so the seeing of renunciance becomes a source, you would say it's a blessing, because when one sees a renunciance, it inspires one with the ideal of those who are following the Buddha's path with complete commitment, those who have actually taken, you say, that the burden of the Buddha, that the Buddha has laid down, the burden of leaving the household life, adopting the code of discipline that the Buddha has laid down, training themselves as best as possible in accordance with the principles of the training. And so often just the sight of a samana, of a Buddhist monk or Buddhist nun, for somebody who's never seen one before, the first encounter can be very, a very transformative and decisive effect on their, on their lives, and inspire in them some kind of sudden trust in the Buddha Dhamma. If the manner, the deportment of that samana is truly inspiring. <laughs> like I remember the first time that I ever saw a Buddhist monk, very interesting case, 
It was in 19, let's see. After my junior year in college, would have been 1965, I was traveling with some people from Brooklyn College, where I went to college. We were traveling by car from New York to San Francisco that summer. And the people who I was traveling with, they had some friends in Madison, Wisconsin. And so, the first day we traveled from New York to Madison, Wisconsin, and we stopped at the house of their friends to spend the night. And the next morning, it was a very bright, beautiful, sunny morning, so I decided to go for a walk. And so I was taking a walk and following one, one street after another, and before long I found myself on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. I was just walking through the campus, and suddenly, in the corner of my eye, the door of a building flings open, and then a little man steps out with East Asian features, with a robe, if I remember correctly, it was closer to the color of your t-shirt than this color. <laughs> it wasn't the bright eye. <laughs> It wasn't the bright, shiny orange, but it was something like that color, with a very bright smile on his face, twinkle in his eyes, and then a tall, tall man stepped out, wearing a suit, stepped out alongside him, who looked like a professor. And I, just a few months earlier, I had started to read about Buddhism, and so I recognized from the color of the robe that this is a Buddhist monk. And I was so, like, I was thrilled with joy. You know, I wanted to go to speak to him, to ask him who he is, what he's doing here, but I was too shy, and so I just sort of devoured, devoured him with my eyes as he walked across the campus, and then they disappeared into another building. And it was over. I was so sad, I thought, I'm never going to see him again. Okay, what happened two years later, this was when I was at graduate school and this Buddhist monk from Vietnam came to stay in the same residence hall where I was living and we became friends. And he was telling me about an elder monk that he knew named Thich Minh Chao who was the founder of the Buddhist University in, in Saigon, who was called Van Hein University. And he told me that this monk had studied in India and he wrote his dissertation comparing the Pali Majjhima Nikaya with the Chinese Madhyama Agama. Okay, after some months, he told me that this monk who wrote that dissertation, was coming to Los Angeles. And our school was about 20 miles from Los Angeles. And so he invited me to come along with him to meet that monk. And so we went to the house of this Vietnamese family where the monk was staying. And then when we arrived and the people of the house, they went to the room where the monk was staying and then knocked on his door and he came out and I looked. And it looked just like the monk that I saw at the University of Wisconsin two years earlier. And so, but I thought, you know, could just be a coincidence. I can't rush to any conclusion. So for a while they were all speaking in Vietnamese. And so I waited till they finished, and when I had the chance, I came to him and I asked him, I said, Sir, is it possible that Two years ago, maybe in August 1965, could you have been at the University of Wisconsin? And he said, in fact, I was. <laughs> he said that my friend, Professor Richard Robinson, was setting up a program of Buddhist studies at the University of Wisconsin, and he had invited me to come to the U.S. to discuss the program that we had at our university in Saigon. <laughs> And so this is like the strange working of karma. So anyway, that was sort of my first sight of a samana, of an ascetic. Okay, but it's not enough 
according to this sutta, seeing the ascetic, the renunciant, can be a starting point that inspires a person, arouses some kind of faith in them, or at least curiosity. But the Buddha says, he says that there are monks who are accomplished in virtue, concentration, wisdom, liberation. So he says, even the sight of those monks is helpful, even listening to them. Uh, yeah, so it's not enough just to see them, but it's important to listen to them when they're teaching the Dhamma, to approach them if one has questions, then one approaches them, one can ask questions in order to draw upon your knowledge, and then one can attend on them if one has the chance, recollect them, call them to mind, and then for those so inspired to go forth under them. Okay, so the seeing of renunciants can be a blessing in itself and can also lead to other blessings as one deepens one's connection with the renunciants. Okay, then the last quality or blessing mentioned in this verse is discussions on the Dhamma. So in Pali, this is Dhamma Sapkacha. And so, yesterday the question came up, like, I don't remember the context exactly, but one has an understanding, some understanding of the Dharma. So one can sometimes grasp upon one's understanding and think one truly understands. But the question was, like, how, if one is mistaken in one's grasp of one's view, how does one get to transform one's view? So one of the ways that this is done is by having discussions on the Dhamma. So of course they should be discussions amongst people who have <coughs> a fairly good knowledge of the Dhamma, or if there's a discussion, maybe people not so knowledgeable themselves, but there should be somebody who can be leading the discussion who is knowledgeable in order to guide it along the right track. But when you have a discussion, an open discussion on the Dhamma, then you get a chance, if you have questions, you can present questions to the group, and then you get replies from others in the group, and when you voice your opinion, then you get feedback from others, and that can help to change your understanding. So we could say that holding discussions on the Dhamma is a very useful way to sharpen one's understanding and to ensure that things that one thinks one understands are understood correctly, and if you've misunderstood, then you have the chance to correct your understanding. And sometimes, you know, it's not always the case that you are the one who misunderstood, but it could be that others in the group have misunderstood, and then you have the opportunity to help to correct the misunderstandings of others. And sometimes out of the discussions, back and forth discussions, like whole new perspectives will open up that none of the participants on their own had thought of previously. It's just called a kind of higher synthesis of views <laughs> emerges. <laughs> you know, from A, view A encounters view B, and then out of the discussion, a new way of understanding view C will emerge. Okay, maybe we could have like just a few minutes before we take a little break for questions. Please. Um, just on that last point, um, Ante, when you were talking about uh, views, um, I was wondering what the role is of study and practice and just mm -hmm. developing one's view intellectually before you practice. Okay, that's a very important, very good question. Okay, the question is like, what is the relationship between study and practice and whether it's necessary to have like a thorough theoretical knowledge before one practices? I, I was wondering like how meditation helps develop the view and how you might develop meditation. Like what's the relationship? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I would say that the relationship is one of a kind of mutual support so that 
having some kind of intellectual or theoretical knowledge will help to guide one's practice, particularly in relation to meditation practice, having access to the text, which will explain like, what are the obstacles that one, well, first, like what are the basic methods of practice, what are the obstacles one's going to face, how to deal with the obstacles. So those are things that we find in the text. So having that kind of knowledge of the text could be helpful. Though also it's always valuable to have the direct personal input from a teacher to rely just entirely on the text. If one has to, of course, that's the way one can go about it. But sometimes one's personal questions are so person-specific that it's good to get the direct input from a teacher. Um, and as far as clarifying one's understanding of the Dharma, there I would say that the study of the suttas is invaluable. Because that is what gives us, I would say, the big picture within which the practice is situated. And I always say to go directly to the primary text, even though they are somewhat difficult to read. Because just if one reads a lot of secondary sources, then one is always getting interpretations. But if you go to the primary sources, then you get it, you know, straight from, you know, from the either from the Buddha himself or at least from the early stratum of Buddha's teachings. And so actually I put together that book, I see it there, it's called In the Buddha's Words. Because if you just pick up a whole Nikaya, the suttas just go from topic to topic and there's no meaningful, what I call a meaningful sequence to them. So what I try to do is to develop a blueprint that shows the underlying architecture of the Dhamma and then fit the suttas into that scheme so it progresses step by step. Yes, please. In relation to that, I forgot the sutta where the Buddha is talking about applying the knowledge, testing it for yourself. And so how do you see that being in taking the teachings, practicing, testing, is this true? And then coming back, understanding. <coughs> Trying to think of the, the sutta. I forgot which, they're coming to me and the Buddha says, don't take it, my understanding, if it's correct, don't take this just my word, find for yourself, apply it, do it yourself, and see if it's true. <coughs> Is that the Kalama Sutta? I think. It's. Yeah, okay, the Kalama Sutta, first we have to recognize in the Kalama Sutta, the Kalamas, those are the people the Buddha is speaking to, are not at that point the Buddha's <coughs> disciples. Right, right. They're just like people living in this town that the Buddha visits on his, in the course of his travels. And so they have been confused by many different ascetics coming through and promoting their own doctrine and then tearing down the doctrines of their rivals. Mm -hmm. And so then the Kalamas come to the Buddha and say, we're com com confused and perplexed. We don't know what's true, what's false. So the Buddha is not going to say to them, let me teach you the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> Since then, the Buddha will just be teaching his own doctrine. Right. So he wants to find call an area of agreement that anybody, sensible person, can consent to. So he questions them and gets them to see for themselves that when greed, hatred, and delusion arise in a person, they arise for that person's harm and suffering, and they'll motivate that person to engage in actions that bring suffering to others. Whereas when the opposite qualities arise, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, we can say generosity, kindness, wisdom, they'll be for the benefit of that person, and they'll also motivate the person to engage in actions that will be beneficial to others. Yes, I just want to wrap this up. Okay, so here the Buddha is not sort of teaching the principles that are sort of special to his own dispensation, but he's starting from points 
matters that people and somebody who uses a little reflection can immediately for themselves within their experience. So would you say that spirit of inquiry, almost like I see it as the, the scientific method, like here's this hypothesis, yeah. Yeah. test it yeah. and see if it's true. As you were speaking to people that were not believers, do you yeah. see that even as we progress through our practice? Here's this teaching. How yeah. is this well, the teaching is said to be sanditigo, like something that one could see for oneself. Though there are teachings of the Buddha that for most people, even most advanced practitioners, are not immediately visible, mm -hmm. like the workings of karma and rebirth, unless one gains the divine eye based on the fourth jhana then one doesn't see the workings of karma. And even probably the detailed, intricate workings would be visible, not even visible to those who have the divine eye, but it takes the special knowledge of a Buddha to see the detailed workings of karma. But those we accept, I could say, I accept on trust from the Buddha. Okay, can you? Yes, um, I, uh, I struggle sometimes with the, you know, the issue of anger and the use of it. Um, because honestly, I I I I feel that there is a place for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like you said, just how you're manifesting it, but I, yeah. it's a place yeah. where I think that sometimes the Dharma is used to kind of shut that down. Yeah. Like legitimate feelings and yeah. emotions around yeah. something that people have legitimate uh, yeah. right to feel. Yeah. And so it's a struggle in terms of dealing with those situations when that happens. Yeah. And you see it happening, and then my second, um, my question, my other question, second question would be about uh, what do you do when someone's conditioning um, makes them feel like you're angry when you're not? Like you know, I you know when, when there's conditioning or something. Okay, like okay, okay. Let me deal first with the first question, because I think that's a very important question, and I would understand or I make a distinction maybe, like we use the word anger as the translation of the Pali word koda or the Sanskrit koda. I say that in Pali and in Sanskrit that word koda implies a kind of anger that takes control of the mind so that one is in a sense no longer in control of one's own mind. And so it's like the bubbling of a fury, and then one is no longer sort of able to control one's mind. But this anger just motivates one and drives one into, well, it can drive one into unwholesome types of behavior, or it just obsesses the mind and takes control of the mind. But I think that also as a kind of advocate for social justice myself, that there's a kind of, I have used the expression in my own thinking some of you use moral indignation, or I like the expression moral outrage, which is different from rage. Rage is that anger that controls the mind. But this is where one finds, say, activities, actions, policies, and so forth, that are unjust, contrary to one's sense of what is right and good. And then one wants to stand up firmly and strongly to oppose those. And so one can manifest a kind of behavior like speaking strongly, taking determined action, which might look on the outside like it's anger, and maybe in the English word anger can also cover that. But because of the mental training, that quality of firm determination, or one is able to turn the anger into firm determination, and the moral outrage in that one is standing up against something that one sees to be immoral, contrary to the requirements of ethics, and one is standing up strongly for what one sees to be right, just, and necessary, and does it, again, with strong determination, strong conviction, being ready to speak up strongly and take strong action, non-violent action, but one is One's mind is not overcome by emotion, but is able to sort of channel the emotion into that determined action. 
So that's the first question. Did it also deal with the second? In a, in a, in a way, I think yeah. that what, uh, what I was getting at was like sometimes with when you're doing this, when you're speaking, that's like someone else conditioning sees it as anger. Oh, I see. So somebody else sees it as anger. If I don't smile, some people think I'm angry. Yeah. Like, literally. Like, yeah. You know, so <laughs> yeah. I'm always angry. <laughs> I didn't know that, but um, yeah. so. <laughs> well, I, I think that's sort of that, that's that's their problem in a way. How do you do that? But but um, <laughs> if if you want to have like a. a causal personal relationship with that person and if they speak to you and say you're always angry or word comes to you that that person is complaining that you're always angry then you could just speak to them directly and say I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm not angry in the sense of the Pali word code. <laughs> not define patient or give more detail about patient, but talk about anger. Um, so I have difficult understanding what patient really is. And what patient really is? Yes, yeah, by itself. Um, yeah. And I don't really see, um, I can understand anger, but I, but I feel like patient is not the solution for, for all kinds of angers. Yeah. For example, um, I'm, I'm morally outraged with Trump, or uh, some of his behavior. Yeah, yeah. Can I just be patient with whatever he's doing? Um, if there's something more active I can do. Like, oh, I mean, definitely, definitely. I, I, don't I mean, this I think is, ties very much in just what I explained to Tanya, yeah. that being patient doesn't mean that one, in fact, also what I said earlier, that one just passively submits to any kind of objectionable behavior on the part of others, that one has to you know, stand up and be, be willing and ready to oppose things that one sees to be unjust, oppressive, um, abusive, and so forth. But it's, the patience is in the quality of the mind, not in the action. So one could have like what I call that moral outrage or moral indignation at some of the things that are taking place and one can stand up against them, one can oppose them, one can write say articles if one has a publishing outfit criticizing the kind of policies or um, go to demonstrations and protests against those policies. So patience doesn't mean that one just passively submits but it's keeping let us say, control over one's own mind so that the mind doesn't get overthrown by the tumultuous emotions. But one channels those emotions, the emotion of resistance and opposition into effective actions. I think one finds that when one could channel the emotion in that way and sort of, what would be the word, sublimate it in that way, that one becomes much more effective than just shouting angrily and waving one fist. And sometimes it, it just doesn't prove to be so effective. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, much more. I thought patience is like you're giving time to yourself and others to do something. You're giving time? Time, like, for me, patience is my time, is not giving time. Well, one of the aspects of patience that I, that I spoke about is like not reacting immediately under a provocative situation, but before one responds, I would say one gives oneself time in the sense of, um, instead of immediately responding, to calm the mind down when we can bring the attention into the body or at the breath or else one can, if one is in a one-to-one -one relationship with somebody, or one to a small group, then you direct loving kindness towards the other person or toward the group. Even just like for five seconds, just quickly bring up the thought, may they be well, may they be happy, may they be safe, then one responds. 
I think we have to take a break now, because we still have another verse to cover this morning. Okay, so let us give about a 10-minute break. <laughs>